All right, good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church and to Equipping Hour. Uh, so come on in and find your seat. We'll get started here again this morning. And I'll open us in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, the things we are about to meditate on together are too weighty for us, too big for us to contemplate, too magnificent for us to rightly behold. They are infinitely beautiful, shocking. The mixing of justice and mercy at the cross is an unfathomable reality to the mere mind of man. And what we can't get our own hearts and minds around, that you, the sinless one, would die in the place of us, the sinners, the just for the unjust, to bring us to your Father, that the ungodly would be justified. What is at one level abominable and to our puny brains not comprehensible is at the same time our only hope. Where else could we turn but the God-man who became flesh, took on the form of a servant, and died the death of an utter slave, condemned as a criminal, and a death not merely at the hands of men, but a crushing under the just wrath of your father. In fact, it pleased your father to crush you that you might bring us to life. And try as we might to articulate, to understand, to meditate on, comprehend, think about our salvation. Surely we will never get it, not in all of eternity. And so we just beg that in the next few moments as we look at what it means that Christ died in our place, that you, Lord Jesus, took our sin upon yourself and went to the cross and paid for it, absorbing every last drop of the wrath of your Father against our sin. That as we contemplate these things, you would be glorified in our puniness, in our weakness, in our confession of need, that you would even visit us this morning in power by your word in the hands of your Holy Spirit to soften our hearts to help us think about a God-centeredness of salvation that you intend, that no man may boast before you, that we would truly sing and live the doxological words from Romans 11, that from you and through you and to you are all things, to you be the glory forever. Amen. And this includes our salvation as well as every meticulous detail in the universe. And you know our hearts, O oh Lord, you know our pride that would seek to smuggle in human merit, human ability, even the, the ginning up of, of human apprehension and belief. <clears throat> and you know our pride that would smuggle in self-satisfaction once we understand that we had nothing to do with our salvation and the temptation we would have to wield such humbling knowledge proudly. Oh God, forgive us. Give us humble hearts to think about these things, humbled again by the gospel of your grace. And to you be all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this morning as we continue our series in Equipping Hour, this is a five-part series. And just a fair warning, uh, part three is going to be two-part. So you've got a five-part series that's going to go six weeks it seems. Um, and, and we're talking this morning about the L in TULIP, uh, which if, if we hold to the traditional version of the acronym stands for limited atonement. Uh, we are speaking this morning of particular redemption. And if you're anything like me, if, if there were five sort of pillars of God's bigness in salvation that got knocked down like dominoes by a Bible... Um, this L in tulip was the last. 
It was the last for me. And, and maybe you're here this morning or you're listening in and you're thinking, hey, I understand that God's in charge of salvation. I believe he's meticulously sovereign over the universe and I believe that he's sovereign over my salvation. I couldn't save myself. God saves sinners. I believe that. But this little thing called limited atonement, I'm not sure I'm there yet. I'm not sure I understand it. I don't see it in my Bible. I read John 3.16 and I see a great big world that Jesus died for and I read 1 John 2.20 that he is a propitiation for our sins, not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And so this idea that Jesus died only for the elect is hard for me to swallow. And, and I'll just tell you up front, if it's hard to swallow that Jesus died for specific people because of texts of Scripture, you're in good company. Uh, we, we want to do theology, not theologically, not logically, not philosophically, but exegetically. That means drawing out the truths of Scripture and seeing them organized systematically. But we must say what God's Word says. We must believe what God's Word proclaims. We must rightly understand it. And whatever God's Word says on this issue, that we must embrace. And, and so if, um, if getting to particular redemption as a conviction is a slow process for you, I'm just going to tell you autobiographically, it was a very slow process for me. And <clears throat> you may already have some of the inside information on my life on this one. I will just confess to you <clears throat> that um, a young lady that I was interested in happened to be a five-pointer and I was a four-pointer. Now, that would be the wrong kind of incentive to switch camps, as it were. And um, her father uh, asked me to consider some things, some questions that I'll put before you today, some questions that made me rethink my assumptions and made me re-examine some scriptures. And while Ashley Anderson did never say, you can't date my daughter if, I certainly felt the weight of that implication, <laughs> I don't know if you intended that, but it became an important issue for me. Uh, this is important to this girl I'm interested in. It's really important to her dad. <laughs> uh, I wonder if I've turned over all the stones I need to overturn on this. And so I began a quest in my Bible of reading passages because I would not yield on the question for whom did Christ die until the Bible wrestled this doctrine from my cold, dead fingers, right? This was going to be a, a yielding only at the behest of God's word clearly understood. So I did a couple of things. I looked at every passage that related to the question, for whom did Christ die, that I could find. And I read John Owen's book, The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. That's not an easy read. That's not a fast read. Um, but there is no text in my mind outside of Scripture that answers John Owen's arguments in that book. I'm going to recommend some resources to you throughout this series, one of which is on our book table. It's called The Five Points of Calvinism. Uh, it's written by uh, uh, Curtis Thomas uh, Steele, I can't remember Steele's first name, and Lance Quinn. So Steele, Thomas, and Quinn, it's on our book table. Uh, if, there, if there aren't enough copies uh, when you get out there, when you rush out to the book table after equipping hour, just ask Omri. He can order some more. Um, so I'll recommend that book. But if, if, you, if you're unsettled and are willing for a sort of year-long challenge uh, reading-wise that's difficult to read but, but covers every issue in finite detail, I think there's no finer work than John Owen's The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. Um, so I would commend that to you, and I would just say autobiographically, that is a book that reshaped my thinking on this issue, uh, because he dealt with the theological issues, the logical issues, and the philosophical conundrum, conundra, in the issue. But then halfway through the book, the, he turns the corner and deals with every text of Scripture exegetically that deals with the issue. So um, there's no original material in what I'm going to share with you here today. I have been discipled in these things by others who have examined Scripture, and I have been pushed back to Scripture on these things. So uh, if I unintentionally quote others that you've read or heard on this, um, that means we're probably treading some safer ground than me just coming up with things. 
So <clears throat> when we think about the doctrines of grace, we've divided it up into five points. Uh, total depravity, unconditional election, particular redemption, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints, or the preservation of the saints. We'll be talking through uh, those last couple with some different terminology. But all of this, frankly, flows out of depravity. We talked about that last week. That if we get depravity right, if we understand the Bible's assessment of what man is really like, if we understand what God says about what the problem is, that's going to lead us to the correct solution. And particularly, I want us to think about the problem of inability flowing out of the doctrine of total depravity, right? No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. No one can come. No one is able to come from his own strength, from his own abilities, from his own desires, even from his own categories of belief and or rejection or acceptance, this is why we find in the scriptures that repentance is a gift given. That faith itself is a gift given of the Lord. And when we understand what spiritually dead man is capable of, which is nothing pertaining to spiritual life, and that a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit called new birth is required that produces this supernatural, God-pleasing response to the gospel called faith and repentance that's given as a gift. When we understand these things, then frankly, all the five petals of a tulip flow together. In other words, we're not going to find contradictions in Scripture between a right doctrine of total depravity and the purpose and efficacy of the cross work of Christ. We're not going to find a, a, a distinction, a difference, or a discontinuity between all those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to Christ, as if that's at odds with Jesus came to lay down his life for his sheep. So all of these things go together. They go together not just logically, philosophically, theologically, but they go together biblically. So this morning, we're looking at this third section, particular redemption. I wanna, we're going to talk through some descriptions and definitions of a couple different views on the atonement. We're going to look at some particular redemption passages. Those are the Jesus died for his people verses in your Bible. And then we're also, and this will be next week, we're going to look at passages that seem to indicate a general or universal atonement. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you to a group of people uh, called Every Human Being Who Ever Lived Past, Present, and Future. Uh, as the target for whom Christ died under a universal or general atonement view. And we're going to look at passages that seem to indicate perhaps, uh, maybe at face value, maybe at a first glance, that Jesus died for every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. Um, and we're going to particularly zoom in on texts that use the word world and that use the word all, uh, all and every. And then we're going to take a detailed look at some passages that for me were hang-ups for me embracing particular redemption at a certain period in my life because I wasn't going to yield to my theological heroes just because they said it. It didn't matter what the Johns said. Uh, John Chrysostom, John Calvin, John Piper, John MacArthur, fill in your blank. John, it doesn't matter what they said. It did matter what John the Baptist said. It didn't matter what the Apostle John said. Those guys writing under the authority of the Holy Spirit, speaking under uh, the guidance of God's um, inerrant truth. But it didn't matter what my theological heroes said. That's not how I want to do theology. Frankly, it didn't matter what my pastors said about it if it disagreed with the Bible. The Bible wins. The Bible wins over creeds. The Bible wins over heroes. The Bible wins over systems. The Bible wins uh, over any human articulation. And so I needed to look at a couple passages. So next week when we're together again, we'll, we'll unfold, we'll unpack John 3.16. We'll unfold 1 John 2.20. Uh, those are two texts that use the word world. And then we'll look in 1 Timothy at the use of the word all in some of those texts that have some bearing on this issue. And we'll use those as templates for thinking through those kinds of words throughout the scriptures. By the way, it's not enough in any theological conversation to have your passages while the other side has its passages. 
right? You, you, you don't just line up numbers of Bible verses against the other stack of Bible verses, and whichever side of a theological issue has the most verses wins. That's not how the Bible works. The Bible is one book by one author, um, and, and if you're ever in a conversation, you say, ooh, um, Isaiah 53, oh yeah, John 3.16, you're not doing it right. There's no, oh yeah, as if Isaiah 53 and John 3.16 are fighting. They're not fighting. And you know that when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door and they take you to a Bible verse and then you say, yeah, let's go to that Bible verse. And then immediately they go, oh no, but let's go to this other one. And you, you go, okay, let's go to this other one. And you go, well, I have all these verses that say Jesus is God. Yeah, but I have all these verses that say Jesus is a man. Yeah, I believe those too. I believe your verses and my verses and they're not fighting, right? So we, so we don't stack up verses against each other. Um, we just want to understand truth in a way that accords with every single verse in the Bible, right? And, and any verse, rightly understand, can overturn a system of theology if that system is wrong and cannot accommodate that one verse. Uh, when we say the Bible wins, we mean the, the Bible trumps every human articulation of truth. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to understand these things in their depth. How could we? Um, we're, we're going to be something like a flat rock bouncing across the top of a lake enough times that it gets to the other side of the lake and goes up on the shore. That we're not going to sink in, much less drink in the entire lake. Not for all of eternity will we drink in the entire lake of God's plan of soteriology, how he saves sinners. These things are too big for us, too rich. Um, to comprehend things of an infinite scale is not something a finite, puny mind will ever do in all of eternity. And that's good. That means, number one, uh, we're not God. Number two, heaven's not boring. You will never exhaust what's there in understanding the depths and the glories of God and His truth. Let's talk about a couple of definitions as we start. Universalism, universalism is the view that everybody goes to heaven. That's universalism, okay? Uh, I, I don't believe anybody here holds to that view. And most universalists, frankly, don't hold to that view. They, they hold out for some sort of hell or annihilation for Adolf Hitler and, you know, their ex-wife and wh whoever else they, they don't happen to like. Um, but a strict universalist would say everybody goes to heaven, even Satan. And, and there are some in print who ascribe to that. So Arminianism is not universalism. Do you understand what I'm saying there? A universal atonement view in Arminianism is not universalism. So universalism says everybody goes to heaven. A universal atonement is simply the view that Jesus died for every human being who ever lived past, present, and future in the same way. But that doesn't mean everybody goes to heaven. In, in their view... Heaven is lost by rejection of the gospel, by unbelief. So you can believe so as to be saved and go to heaven, even if you don't um, agree with what I think is Scripture's testimony about the reason for Christ's death, what he accomplished in his death, and for whom he died. Does that make sense? You can be saved and be an Arminian. I hope you know that and believe that and love your friends. Um, so user, universal atonement is the view that not everyone goes to heaven, but that Christ's death on the cross accomplished the same thing for everybody equally. So whether someone goes to heaven or not is conditioned on belief. Whereas particular redemption believes that Christ's death on the cross actually secures salvation for some, for God's people. So universal atonement limits the atonement in extent on condition of belief. That means universal atonement. Jesus died for everybody. They still limit the atonement in the sense that not everybody goes to heaven. But they also limit the atonement in, the, in terms of what it accomplishes in its efficacy. Jesus' death on the cross in that universal atonement view does not actually accomplish salvation. Do you understand what I'm saying? Whereas a particular redemption view limits the atonement in scope, but not in its effect. 
So in particular redemption, Jesus' death on the cross actually accomplishes salvation. But just not for everybody. Okay, so in both views, not everybody goes to heaven. But in one view, Jesus died for people who do not benefit from his death. And in the other view, um, Jesus came and did something very particular for a group of people for whom he saw it all the way through. That's, that's the difference. Universal atonement is potential for everyone, guaranteed to no one. Christ's death didn't actually secure salvation of anyone. Human belief secures salvation. In particular redemption, salvation is actual, guaranteed, and secure for God's people. The design of the cross of Christ and the effect of the cross of Christ are the same. What God began in eternity past, all those whom he foreknew, we talked about this last time, those he foreloved, those he was in intimate relationship with before time began, that's not looking down the corridors of time and seeing who will believe and then choosing them. That is a foreknowledge of intimate relationship, prognosco, it is a foreloving of actual persons, not a foreseeing of facts. God does not look down the corridors of time and see that somebody believed. He foreloved and foreknew individuals relationally. And all those whom he foreknew, he actually predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. So God carries it through to completion from beginning to end. By the way, the the word atonement, in thinking about the extent of the atonement or the question for whom did Christ die, is not a particularly helpful word in this discussion. Uh, The word atonement is an English invention from three words, at one meant. Do you see that up there on the screen? At one meant. Atonement. You say it fast enough, you start saying atonement. And, And it is the idea of reconciliation. Two parties who are at enmity are brought into one. And that English word atonement atonement, represents technical words both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, four times in the New Testament and dozens and dozens and dozens of times in the Old Testament to describe something very specific, the assuaging of divine wrath by innocent substitution. That's the idea of atonement. The the technical original language words behind it talk about the assuaging of God's wrath. God's wrath is absorbed and done away with by a substitute death in the place of another. So when we're talking about atonement, something innocent dies so that the guilty gets to be at one with God. If we're talking about who's made at one with God, well, of course, we... We could only mean, should only mean, believers. Those who are in Christ. Those who are actually reconciled. We shouldn't talk about an atonement that doesn't atone. We shouldn't talk about an atonement that doesn't assuage the wrath and bring two hostile parties together. If we want to talk about the extent for whom Christ died, let's ditch the word atonement. And let's just frankly talk about what did Jesus intend to do with the cross? Create an equal opportunity for everyone uh, out of generosity and love? Or did he, in love, actually pay for the sins and secure salvation for his people? Those are the questions we're asking between the two views. So I would love it if the word atonement was just dropped out of the debate altogether. So we're really asking the question, for whom did Christ die? If we deny universalism, and we should but we affirm a universal atonement that Christ died for all. We need to ask some questions. What becomes of those who were already in torment when Christ came and died on the cross? Did Jesus pay for their sins? Right? And and this is a sort of a loaded philosophical question. Did Jesus pay for the sins of those who were already in hell when he came? It's a, that's a question that tips us off to maybe we need to think about some things a little bit. Um, what about the citizens of hell? Um, what do they pay for in hell if Jesus paid for their sins at the cross? Is there double jeopardy? Uh, do those sins get unpaid for and, and reconstituted? Or did Jesus only pay potentially for their sins? 
And if so, when does he pay for them actually? Does he pay for them when they believe? Uh, these are some, some critical questions, and, and they may not have answers. These are sort of the, the questions of philosophers. Uh, we have to get to texts, but I want to quote R.C.H. Lenski. He's a good commentary. He's a Lutheran. He's really dependable in a lot of areas, um, but this is what he says about this question. The instant Christ died, the whole world of sinners was changed completely. It was now a world for whose sin atonement had been made and no longer a world with unatoned sins. His atonement and the reckoning are valid for the universe of men. Even all the damned in hell were thus reconciled to God. Not as men who were never reconciled are they damned, but as men who spurned God's reconciliation through Christ. The reconciliation, he goes on to say, which is effective for the whole world of sinners by changing their status from unredeemed to redeemed, does not save any of them until it is bestowed individually and received individually. Unbelief rejects the reconciliation and thus perishes despite it. The reconciliation is there, but unbelief turns from it and thus is not justified on the basis of it but causes the blood of Christ to be shed in vain. This is tragedy indeed, says Lenski. Do you understand his line of argument? He, he's consistent. If Jesus died for everybody, and, and we'll get to this a little bit later, and the cross of Christ is tied to things like reconciliation, justification, redemption, which, which it is in, in texts we'll look at, if, if that's true, if Jesus died for everybody and the death of Christ is actually tied to justification, redemption, we can go on the whole list of soteriological issues, adoption, reconciliation to one another, citizenship in heaven, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If those things are tied, then if Jesus did that for everybody, then those things are true for everybody. And this is where the, the theological, logical deduction runs into trouble with the Bible. Because you will not find the world of sin to be called reconciled, redeemed, or justified. That is where the logical deduction from a theological observation or even a textual observation, the deduction gets me into trouble. We, that's, we don't want to do theology that way. I've got a truth. I've got this other truth, I've got a corollary, I'm going to make a theological deduction, therefore that's true, and if that's true, I'm going to make another deduction, and that's true, I'm now three layers removed from my Bible. I don't want to be three layers removed from my Bible. That's dangerous territory. And, and Lenski dove into that territory, as respectable as he is, as an exegete in so many other areas. To say that the the, the status of the world of sinners has changed from unredeemed to redeemed, and yet they're not saved, is a problem. That's a problem biblically. What are the theological implications for the view that Christ died for all? And here all, I think I've given my definition of all in the next one. Um, uh, that's the word you see up there on the screen. Do you see it? The all capitals, all I learned a long time ago that all means all and all as ever means. Um, we'll learn about the word all next week. We'll look at passages with the word all. But I spell all that way. Um, for this argument, it's every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. Right? That, that is what is being claimed in a use of universal atonement. That Christ's death is an equal opportunity atonement for every human being who ever lived past, past present, and future. Right, that's, that's what I will mean in this discussion with a casual use of the word all. Uh, when we get to texts, we're going to let every passage define all for us. Um, we'll, we'll discover very quickly the word all does not always mean all and all is all ever means. Um, the context will determine that for us. So theological implications for the view that Christ died for every human being who ever lived past, present, and future the removal of sin, the payment of debt, satisfaction of divine wrath, the purchase of sinners, redemption at a price of slaves from the slave market, reconciliation of enemies, all of those things biblically are made possible by the cross under the universal atonement view, but not actually accomplished by the cross work, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. 
The atonement work of Christ cannot therefore be said to be efficacious. You can't say all by itself, the cross did this. Reconciliation, redemption, justification, forgiveness, purchase of a people for God's own possession. If the wrath of God is not satisfied by the cross of Christ, then wrath remains. And if the wrath of God is satisfied by the cross of Christ, then no wrath remains. The implication for the universal atonement view is that hell would exist not for the punishment of sins. They've been paid for. But hell exists for what? Can you fill in the blank? Unbelief. Rejection of the gospel. That's, that's what I would have said years ago. That's what I did say. That's what I've heard others say. That's what uh, people in print who talk about these things, they, they answer the question, why do people go to hell? For unbelief. If they start with the premise that Jesus already paid for the sins of the world. Meaning every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. The, the difficulty in that is when you come to scriptures that answer the question, why are people in hell? What does the Bible say? Liars. <laughs> Adulterers. I mean, it just goes through the list of actual vices. Not paid for vices, so that hell dwellers are there simply for unbelief, as if unbelief is not a sin. But actually, the testimony of Scripture is that people suffer under the just wrath of God because of crimes committed. Crimes still on the ledger. Crimes not taken care of. Sins against a holy God. And the vice lists in Scripture are plethora. It doesn't take long to find them. Now, it is true that if somebody doesn't believe the gospel, they will go to hell. There, there's a reality that, that unbelief is a cause of being in hell. But why are people punished in hell for the sins still unforgiven, not paid for? By the way, is unbelief sin? The answer to that is yes. Unbelief is sin. Condemnable sin. Sin that must be forgiven. It's not just a category, check this box and your sins go away. No, that box itself is sin. To, to reject the gospel, to reject God, to suppress the truth and unrighteousness, to be ungrateful, all of those things, um, they are sin punishable by God. By the way, to not love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, um, at its root is a matter of unbelief. In fact, I think you could trace out unbelief under every sin you could name. And if unbelief is sin, it must be forgiven, paid for. And if unbelief is to be overcome... What could an unbelieving, unregenerate, spiritually dead human contribute to faith? Nothing. It, it has to be foreign. It has to be generated. It has to be, as Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says, a gift. The whole package of salvation by grace through faith is a gift from the Lord so that no man could boast. This is why Paul rejoiced when the Gentiles were granted repentance, grace-given repentance. These things must come from the Lord. I'm going to read to you from Grace Bible Church's biblical convictions and doctrinal statement on the Son's atoning death. This is our church's statement related to particular redemption. In order for God's sovereign and saving choice of sinners to take its full effect and be realized in the lives of sinners in time, God sent his son to earth to be the penal substitutionary sacrifice on behalf of those sinners he elects unto salvation. A sinner's guilt before God and the wrath of God against him must be removed. Sin's debt is removed because Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth and died on the cross to make atonement for every single person who would ever believe in his name. The application of the atonement is limited. It's particular or definite. Clearly, not all in the world are saved. What limits, the, what limits the application of the atoning work of the cross? We believe that it is God, not the unbelieving sinner, who limits the atonement. 
Jesus' death actually secured the salvation of every single one of God's elect. The scope of the applied work of Christ on the cross is limited by God's gracious sovereign choice. Jesus' death did not make salvation potentially possible for all sinners, as if it is up to the totally depraved and unable sinner to decide to apply the atoning work of the cross to his own life through faith. If that were the case, the atonement would be limited by the unbelieving sinner's refusal to believe, making the sinner sovereign in salvation, not God. And that's a mouthful. It's a paragraph. You can see that on our church's website, uh, in our doctrinal statement. You got a packet with that in your membership packet. And at the bottom of that paragraph is a whole list of verses that you can look at, meditate on, uh, think on, and read further. We'll go through some of those today and next week. Before we move any farther, I want to put in front of us some theological questions and concerns, some practical concerns related to the doctrine of particular redemption, that Christ died only for some. Maybe you've had these questions. Maybe you've heard these questions. Maybe these questions trouble you this morning. If Christ died only for some, should I do evangelism? Right? We covered some of that last week. Should you do evangelism? Yes. Why? Because God said so. Um, as, uh, as, as one pointed out, um, the proclamation of the gospel in the face of unbelief is actually an indictment that will be held accountable for that unbelief in the eternal state. I didn't mention that one last week. Um, thank you, Steve. And um, we give a, a whole host of reasons why we should preach the gospel. It's a matter of obedience. It glorifies God. It's just straight worship when you proclaim how great a Savior is. And it is the means, gospel proclamation is the means by which God brings his own to himself. And it's beautiful. And all of us are beneficiaries of that very thing. So should we evangelize? If Jesus died for his sheep, I would say, well, if Jesus died for his sheep, actually secured them by his blood, and then provided the means by which they believe, which is you preaching the gospel, then yes, you should preach the gospel. <laughs> you are the means by which God brings in his sheep into his fold by faith. God uses means. God uses the human agency of gospel proclamation by faith, and he uses the human constitution of the will transformed through the agency of faith given as a gift to actually believe the gospel and be saved. God secures all of these things, including the means. So if we're disobedient in evangelism, that's on our shoulders but we should never rest on our theological hunches. Well, Christ died for his own, so, you know, I don't need to do anything. No, Christ died for his own, and he saved you so that you can be his ambassador so that he could bring his own to himself. Uh, we are means in that chain. It also brings up this question, whom should we evangelize? Well, I'm only going to preach the gospel to people for whom Christ died. No, friends, you're going to preach the gospel to everything that moves, and by preaching the gospel, you will discover for whom Christ died. Preach the gospel to everybody. That is the New Testament pattern, by the way. Um, that is behind the universal offer of the gospel in the New Testament. The universal offer of the gospel on the lips of Jesus and on the lips of the apostles. Even Paul, who wrote about God's sovereignty and salvation deeply, did not know who the elect were. Sure would be nice. Hey, could I see your arm? Do you have that election tattoo? You know, the E, I shine a black light on it. There it is. Okay, I'm going to preach the gospel to you. Actually, God keeps us humble. Preach the gospel. Be persecuted. I mean, think about Jeremiah's ministry. Uh, Forty years of proclamation of truth. Hardly anybody listened. If you were Jeremiah in Jeremiah's shoes, uh, would you start guessing at who's going to be heart soft receptive to this message? Would you have ever picked Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian eunuch, the out of towner, the Gentile, to rescue you out of a hole, listen to the gospel, and then have Yahweh say about Ebed Melech, he trusted in Yahweh? Would you ever have picked him? No, just proclaim the truth indiscriminately and see who responds. That's our task. Another question that comes up is Is the gospel a genuine offer? Is that universal offer? Many are called, few are chosen. The path is broad that leads to destruction, narrow that leads to life. Is it a genuine offer of the gospel, a genuine offer of God's mercy and love to say, hey, there is a savior to anyone who believes. 
Anyone who will come, come to Christ. Yes, that is a genuine offer and is absolutely true. I, I, I tried to work an illustration uh, years ago. I, it was, I think it was the first year I was here. And, uh, we were starting to disciple men um, in the what we called H3. It's now called the trust, uh, systematic theology and learning to preach and those kinds of things. Some of you guys might have been in that class. And um, I decided, hey, we're going to go on an evangelistic outing and we're going to go preach the gospel. Or we're just going to find an audience. And um, so we got in some SUVs and, and we drove up to North Tempe, pulled over to the side of the road. And I'm sure the guys were thinking, 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning, who's going to be out milling about to hear the gospel? And I'm kind of scared, nervous. Cold turkey evangelism is just not for me anyway. And we get out of the SUVs, line the guys up, and it's a field and um, it's all headstones. I'm not suggesting this was a good exercise. <laughs> I'd rather tell you about it than reenact it because um, telling you about it's just better. Uh, stood the, we all stood up there and I said, okay, go. Who's going to preach the gospel? Somebody, go first. And I wanted that picture emblazoned on my own heart and, and sort of tattooed on the eyelids of the men as we think about what evangelism is. This is Ezekiel 36 and 37, the new covenant, the spirit working to bring to life that which is dead. Ezekiel was told, that preach to the dry bones. And what happens? The spirit comes, <clears throat> joins bones together, puts ligaments and sinews on them and covers them with flesh and makes them live Evangelism is proclaiming the truth to death, to dead people, spiritual corpses. And in the preaching of the gospel, the spirit makes alive. So can we make the invitation? Yes, make the invitation. God compels us, be ambassadors. And so we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. How should we present the death of Christ? This is an important question. How should we present the death of Christ and the love of God? Um, you hear the language around here. You, every week we, we, we um, get a meditation at the time of communion and, and men will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And, you, and listen to the language the men use. That Jesus came and paid for all the sins of everyone who would ever believe. Do you hear that? That's, that's simultaneously particular and inviting and that's on purpose. Whoever believes. So sinner, you're sitting here this morning. You're hearing about Christ. Believe in the gospel and you will be saved. Any of you. I don't know who you are. And Jesus paid for the sins. Paid for them. Actually paid for them. For the sins of everyone who would ever believe. Past sins, present sins, future sins. Of everyone who will believe. The, the universal offer is good. Um, I want to be careful not to present the death of Christ this way. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're at with the Lord, but Jesus died for you. Mm. I'm not sure I want to say that that way. My experience in Nashville, the buckle of the Bible belt was pretty interesting. You could talk to just about anybody on the street and, and, and they'd start with, a, oh, I'm a good person. Oh, I'm sort of religious. I've never killed anybody. I go to church or I don't go to church or I'm spiritual or whatever I am. Um, okay, but, but why should God let you into heaven? Because I'm a good person. Yeah, but the Bible says there are no good people. Oh, what was the other hand? Oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. It just rolls off the tongue in the Bible belt. Maybe it rolls off the tongue uh, for you in your own culture and your context. But the, the backdrop of, I've got this get out of hell free card called Jesus died for me because I heard it somewhere and it must be true for everybody. I don't know that that's helpful language. But if you come to Christ knowing that you're a sinner and he is the only savior, then yes, he died for you and you should be able to sing Jesus died for me in my place. That whole idea of Jesus dying in our place is the idea of substitution that actually satisfies divine wrath and secures salvation for all who believe. Those are deep words, Jesus died for me. That little word for, that uh, preposition in there, it is theologically weighty. And it means that the payment's been made. The critical issue for us, of course, is not how does this work out philosophically, logically, theologically, or even practically. 
right? I, I don't need to know how it works together that Jesus died for his sheep and I should preach the gospel to everyone. If the Bible says it, I just need to do that, right? I, I don't necessarily have to work it out practically, make it make sense in my puny brain. Critically, we need to know what the Bible says, so particularly, what does the Bible say about the death of Christ in the place of sinners? What does the Bible say about who it was for and what it accomplished? That's our task in this lecture. Does the Bible present the death of Christ as an event procuring potential for everyone equally or as an event securing salvation for some particularly? Does the Bible indicate that Jesus paid for our sins potentially or actually? And again, all those other uh, realities of salvation, justification, sanctification, adoption, regeneration, faith, repentance, the purchase of a people for God's own possession, do they come about as actually secured by the death of Christ? Or does the death of Christ make salvation and all of its parts potential for all, guaranteed for none? You've perhaps used a bridge analogy in evangelism. God's over here, you're over here, there's this infinite gap between you two, and the cross is like the bridge between. Lorraine Bettner, the uh, theologian um, who wrote on the topic of predestination, used a bridge analogy this way. He said, um, the atonement in the um, particular redemption view is like a narrow bridge which goes all the way across the stream. But in the universal atonement view, it's like a great wide bridge that only goes halfway across. So uh, next slide has a, has a bridge. And on this bridge is every human being who ever lived past, present, and future. So this is a glorious, beautiful, big bridge that fits everybody. Every human being who ever lived past, present, and future can fit on that bridge, and it's designed to hold all of them. It's a remarkable architectural deal. It is an equal opportunity conveyance. It is big. It's unlimited. It's incredible. It's accommodating. It's fair. Right? Do you see it? Where does it go? Well, it, it, it doesn't finish. It, it doesn't... It doesn't get anybody to the other side of that infinite gap. It doesn't actually accomplish what every human being who ever lived past, present, and future who's standing on that bridge needs. The, the spiritually dead people, the spiritually unable people standing on that bridge, for all of its architectural beauty, they need to get to the other side. And, and that bridge doesn't get them there. It, it doesn't accomplish what they need. It doesn't bring spiritual life. It doesn't produce faith or give repentance as a gift. Uh, there's another bridge. Ah, see, you know, the sunset behind it just, that is a pretty bridge. It's so golden. The backdrop is misleading. Okay, so uh, the whole idea here is there, there's another bridge that actually goes all the way across. Now, is every human being who ever lived past, present, and future on that bridge? No, God has designed a secure salvation from beginning to end for people who don't deserve it. For sinners at enmity with God, hostile in their minds, hostile in their activities, hostile in their nature against him, who wouldn't know to look for God, who are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, who don't believe because they can't. And what does God do in the gospel? He actually saves sinners. He saves them. That, I believe, represents what the Bible says. Now, we're going to look at some passages for a few minutes here, and then we'll pick this up next week. We'll look at passages that, that are the Jesus died for his people passages, and then we'll look at those Jesus died for all and every, and Jesus died for the world passages and we'll see what the Bible has to say about all of these things as we put them together. Now, as you think through these passages, as we tuck away these Bible verses, maybe memorize some, mark some, um, avoid others. Uh, no, we don't want to do that. We want the whole counsel of God's word. And, and the point here is not to build up a list to win an argument. 
The point here is not to build up a list to fortify my fortifications against some other view of soteriology. Friends, the the texts we're looking at, they describe what God the Son, in all of His innocent beauty and perfection, chose to do in inter-Trinitarian agreement to come to earth and be our sacrifice, to be the lamb led to slaughter, who did not open his mouth, who did not utter complaint, to our Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane, who said, not my will, but your will be done. Could this cup of your infinite wrath for their sins not be poured out on me? Is there another way? No, there's no other way. Your will. Sweat drops of blood over the agony of the anticipation of what it would mean for him to bear my sin. Theology is not a toy to play with. Like we pick out some verses, we look at it in our hands, and, and we just sort of toss it around. Maybe we, uh, we throw it at other people and, and we, we compare our, our systems and compete with one another and fight. It, 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 it's none of those things. This is the doctrine of God saves sinners. Lest we ever forget that we are the sinners in that equation. And God is still God, and it was at infinite cost that he maintained his own just reputation while considering us justified. Uh, We just don't want to lose sight of, of what these things are, what these texts say. So turn in your Bible to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is perhaps the clearest gospel proclamation in all of the Bible, proclaimed 700 years before Jesus was a baby at Bethlehem, describing the the life, the ignominy, the, the servanthood, the being misunderstood, earthly ministry life of Christ, and then his torturous execution at the hands of sinful men and his abiding under the wrath of his father, and then his death, burial, resurrection, glorious ascension, intercession, and return as king. All of that is here um, pre-preached before Jesus even came in Isaiah 53. Listen to verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. We ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? So all those we's and ours and us's in Isaiah 53, they have a referent. Those are pronouns with specific people in view. And, And I believe the people in view here in Isaiah 53 are those Jews who will believe the gospel when God pours out his spirit of grace and supplication in the fulfillment of Zechariah 12.10. I believe they will sing the servant song of Isaiah 53 in their repentance, which is why Isaiah is saying, my people are the ones do all this stuff. He's not talking about all people everywhere. Now, we believers can embrace these lyrics of Isaiah's servant song. Because we know that what is said of repentant Israel is also true of us who have believed. And and yet the language is really remarkable. The suffering servant would come and be cut out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Down in verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Do you see that? as he will bear their iniquities. Um, We don't want to make the word many be small all of a sudden as a reaction to universal atonement. It's a big word that that Jesus would die in the place of many, not a one for one, not one guy as a substitute for one sinner, but a perfect righteous one as a legitimate, wrath-paying, debt 
fulfilling sacrifice for many. It's a great, big, huge atonement. He will bear their iniquities. Down in verse 12 again, he himself bore the sin of many. Listen to the testimony of Matthew 121. She, that is Mary, will bear a son. You will call his name Jesus, that is Yahweh saves, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus will come to save his people from their sins. That's the testimony of him at his birth. Matthew 20, 28, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 26, 28, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Luke 19, 10, the son of man has come to seek and listen to this and to save that which was lost. That is an actual statement of the intended purpose of Jesus coming. Not to make potential the salvation of everyone on equal footing, but to actually save. That's why he came, to actually save. Listen to John 6. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. I said to you, you've seen me, you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will not cast out. I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but I raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. What is Jesus saying? I came to do what the Father sent me to do, to come get these people and to secure them forever. How will they be secured? That they believe when the Son of Man is lifted up. And you see in that very text, our belief and Jesus' intended purpose, seeking a people, paying for those people, and securing their salvation all go together. They're not enemies in Scripture. And we'll close with one last verse, John 10, 11, and then we'll pick up next week where we left off. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And we'll pick up there in John 10 next time. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your Son We could only love you because you first loved us and you loved us as an outflow of your beautiful, glorious, interpersonal, interrelational, intertrinitarian love. And you conspired together against our sins, against our rebellion, against our crimes, against our stiff-necked and hard-hearted rebellion. You decided to break through all of that by your love, paying for sins, granting belief and repentance, giving spiritual life where there was none. God, you saved sinners. For that, we will be eternally grateful. Pray these things in Jesus' name.